Now, I want to remind all of you that as we were back in Romans chapter 5, Paul began to show us as believers the ramifications of our justification through faith in Jesus Christ. And the primary ramification he wanted to ensure that we understood was the fact that you and I are guaranteed access to glory, that we really will attain all of the promises of God. Now, today, as we go into Romans 8, 35 through 39, Paul is going to reach a crescendo in his argument, and he's going to show us that nothing in all of creation can ever separate the believer from the love of Christ. And so you and I are going to learn today the very profound truth that our God is so loving and he is so powerful that nothing in all of the cosmos will ever be able to separate us from attaining the promises of God. And so what that means, dear brothers and sisters, is you and I can live a life of confidence, a life without fear as we go out the doors today. We belong to him by faith forevermore. Now, I want to remind you last week, sorry, I'm traveling. I got Spock-like ears, apparently, and I'm having trouble getting my... That Vulcan uh, DNA is coming out again. <laughs> having trouble getting these earpieces on. Last week in Romans eight thirty-one through 34, Paul reminded us that you and I will never have a charge that will stick against God's elect. Well, now, as he continues here in the first couple of verses, 35 to 36, that we're studying, he's going to show us that nothing can separate us from Christ. He asked the question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, dear ones, I want you to note in the opening question that Paul asked, when he asked the question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? As you're going to find out, the implied answer is nothing and no one. But I first of all want to talk about that phrase, the love of Christ. In theology, this is what we call a subjective genitive, simply meaning Christ is the subject and you and I as believers are the objects of his love. And so the love of Christ has to do and consists of all of the care that Christ has for us as our creator and redeemer. And so what goes part and parcel with Christ's love for us is the fact that you and I are going to be the recipients of what is best. If you're suffering currently in this world, you can be absolutely confident that it is for your best. Why? Well, we learned in Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. Now, you and I are absolutely assured of receiving a resurrected body. Why? Because that's our best. It's for her best. One day we're also going to reign with Christ in an eternal kingdom in glory. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. Why? Because that's what's for our best. It's in her best interest. And so the love of Christ, the fact that he loves us, implies that you're going to receive his best. And we're going to learn today that there's nothing that can separate us from that love and that care. Now, notice Paul gives seven items as representative possibilities of things in creation that seemingly could separate you from the love of Christ and the promises of God. Notice he begins with tribulation. Tribulation, the term thalipsis, is a term that's often rendered in our Bibles affliction. And what's very interesting is we look at everything that Paul lists here, whether it's tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Each of these things Paul the apostle personally dealt with in his life. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, these are things that he personally dealt with. And yet he personally knew that these things could not separate him from the love of Christ or the promises of God. And so that's for us today. We have to know that too. We have to know that none of these things can ever separate us from the promises of God. In Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at each of them, whether it's tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, there's seven things. And in each of them, the worst thing that could ever happen to you as a result of any of them would be that you would die. But the Apostle Paul himself said to live as Christ and die as gain. And what you and I have to realize is that physical death is no problem for the believer. Why? As 
Bob Ranwick was just saying in his prayer, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in our application. In the intermediate state prior to the resurrection, after the death of the believer, it is a glorious thing because we will be, in fact, in the presence of God. So if that's the worst thing that can ever happen is that you'd be in the presence of God, that isn't so bad, is it? Nothing can ever separate you from the promises of God. Now, what's very interesting is notice as you come down to verse 36, Paul's going to cite the Old Testament to show that this is the way it's always been for the people of God. Verse 36, he cites from Psalm 44, 22. Notice in all caps, he says, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, why does Paul cite that psalm, Psalm 44, 22? Well, let me set the context originally of Psalm 44. I think Paul is interpreting this psalm in context, and I think he always does that when he cites an Old Testament reference. Psalm 44 was written by the psalmist during some national calamity that happened to Israel. And more than likely, this national calamity that had come upon Israel was a result of them losing in battle. Some scholars think they lost a battle to the Arameans. Some think it was to the Edomites. But either way, the big picture is clear. Israel was routed in battle. And normally when that occurred in history, it was because of some sin that they had committed. It was because they had broken covenant with God or they engaged in some form of idolatry. But what's unique about Psalm 44 is the psalmist indicates that there was nothing that Israel had done wrong. In fact, the reason why they were suffering was simply because they belonged to the God of Israel. And so the great lesson that God was teaching the people was that simply by belonging to him, the God of Israel, the only creator, the world was going to hate them just as the world hated him. And so Paul cites then this verse to show us that there indeed is nothing new under the sun. If you belong to Jesus Christ, the living God, the world is going to hate you. But despite having those types of tribulations in this world here and now and suffering like that, Paul says none of that can ever separate you ultimately from the love of Christ and the promises of God. In fact, as he continues here in verses 37 through 39, we're going to see that we're even more than conquerors because of what he's done for us. Paul says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor principalities, excuse me, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, dear ones, I want you to notice here at the beginning of verse 37, notice the but. That's a contrastive conjunction, and I would, better, I would better translate that on the contrary. The reason why is verse 37 is answering the question from verse 35. Remember verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will persecution, will tribulation, peril, sword, nakedness, famine, etc.? Remember? And then the obvious answer to that question now is being answered, but it's not a but. I would say if I was writing the Eric Dauma version, it's better rendered, on the contrary, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And so Paul is saying absolutely not. There is nothing that could ever happen to you that will separate you from Christ. In fact, notice in the box, we overwhelmingly conquer. The term in the Greek there, huper nikao. Nikao means to conquer. You can hear the prefix added to that, huper. In English, we get the term hyper. It's hyper conquering. So what Paul is saying is that because of what Christ has done, you and I as the people of God are not just at the end going to squeak out a narrow victory. This isn't a fourth quarter Hail Mary pass into the end zone where you end up winning by a couple of points. This isn't a single RBI batted in in the bottom of the ninth to pull a victory out by the skin of your teeth. This is overwhelmingly a victory. A victory because of what Jesus Christ done. A victory that is far beyond anything that we can conceive of. Because it's going to lead to resurrection. It's going to lead to a kingdom that will be without end. It's going to lead to glory. But lest you and I think that we're going to accomplish this 
through pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps or through our own abilities. Notice he says, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. It's the work of Christ. This is one of the reasons why I can't stand post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is the doctrine where you and I as Christians are so successful in our own abilities that we Christianize the planet and then Jesus Christ just comes back and takes the reins. Well, whoever came up with that idea didn't read the Bible. Didn't Jesus say when the Son of Man returns to earth, will he find faith? Unless those days be cut short, no flesh would survive. No, dear ones, the kingdom is not going to come about by our efforts. It's purely by the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. It's never through human effort. And so that's why we can be confident. It's through him who loved us that we overwhelmingly conquer. Now, notice Paul in verse 38. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life. Now, he kind of gives opposites here and a string of them. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. He gives all of those things. Now, let's take each of them one by one. I think a lot of them are self-explanatory. But let's talk about death. Death cannot separate us from the promises or the love of Christ. They cannot. Now, obviously, the death that Paul is referring to here must be physical death. Why? Because by definition... If it was spiritual death, spiritual death is separation from God. So physical death, remember death is separation. Physical death is separation of body and soul. And what Paul is saying is even that cannot separate us from the promises of Christ. And I'm going to show you in the application from 2 Corinthians 5.8 that Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Notice he also says nor angels nor principalities. And I think Paul probably here has in mind the demonic realm. Certainly good angels would never want to separate us from the love of Christ. But here, what Paul is assuring is there, there's not even an angelic being in the unseen realm that is powerful enough to steal your hope, to steal the promises and the love of Christ from you. That's powerful. And a lot of people back in the first century, remember, they feared the angelic realm and the demonic. They believed that it controlled their fate. Paul is saying, no, it doesn't. If you belong to Christ, he's the one who controls your fate. Now, notice he also talks about nor height nor depth. Now, some scholars believe that that reference was the height was the star that was at the zenith in the horizon, and the depth was the one that was lowest on the horizon. And so the idea would be in secular Greek, that nothing in the cosmos astronomically or fate really controlled your future, but rather Jesus Christ did. Some scholars believe that that's why Paul mentions that. The problem with that view is height and depth are never used that way in the New Testament. So more than likely, simply Paul is using poetic license to talk about all that is in creation, whether it be heaven or hell, whether it be high or low, nothing in all of creation. In fact, notice at the very end, he gives us those very crucial words, nor any other created thing. That's significant. This is one that you want to put in your theology toolbox. This is a verse you want to put as a magnet verse on your refrigerator. Now, why? Well, if you break down all that exists, it's two categories. It's either the creator or it's the creation. Well, certainly the creator, God who purchased you through the blood of his son, is never going to separate you from his promises. So what's left? If the creator won't do it, it's just anything in the creation. And Paul is saying that nothing in the creation can do so. That means you're secure. Now, the reason I labor this point is I can't tell you how many times I've had Christians who are so concerned about their own eternal security. And they're well-meaning and they'll come up to me and they'll say, you know, I know that there's nothing in creation that will ever separate me from the promises of God. But what if I choose to separate myself? And my response has always been, well, are you part of the creation? And of course, the answer is yes. Yes. And so if you're part of the creation, then not even your own sin, ultimately, if you belong to Jesus Christ by faith, 
can separate you from the love of Christ and the promises of God. Now, as I say that, the Bible here is certainly teaching eternal security, but it is not teaching eternal presumption. Eternal presumption says that, well, I can live like the devil. I don't care about God's word. I show no evidence that I belong to Christ through faith alone, but at the end, everything will work out. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. Instead, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's God who is at work in you to will and to do his good purpose. So, dear ones, what the Scripture is teaching you is that if you really belong to Jesus Christ, nothing, not even your own sin, can ever separate you from him. Think about David's life. David, King David, I'm talking about the king of Israel, was certainly a man known as a man after God's own heart, and yet he sinned grievously. Think about he sent Uriah, a man who was married to the woman Bathsheba, to the front in battle so that he could have him killed off, so that he could have the man's wife. It made David not only an adulterer, but a murderer as well. And yes, he suffered consequences of that sin in this life, but ultimately he was never separated from the love of Christ and the promises of God. Brothers and sisters, take heart. Nothing can ever separate you from the power of God and from the promises of eternal life that he has for you. And what that means, dear ones, as we go out the door today, you and I can be very confident that the world can't do anything to us, number one, that God doesn't allow, but number two, that ultimately matters. What matters is serving Christ and belonging to him. Now, I want to come to our applications here. I have a couple of points that I want to drive home. Number one, We should remember to praise God for his power to save. Oftentimes, many of God's other attributes are singled out and are worshipped and extolled like his love, especially in mainline liberal denominations. But oftentimes, his power is something that people fail to praise. Number two, we should remember that nothing in all creation can keep us from Christ's saving hand. I'm going to personalize this to our relationship with Christ specifically. So let's begin with number one. Praise God for his power. One of the ramifications of theological liberalism in the 19th into the 20th century was that it so overplayed God's love, it started to exclude all of God's other attributes. Now, certainly God is love. In fact, we saw how loving he is all the way through the book of Romans. So loving that he would send his own son. God demonstrates his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how loving he is. But he's also a just God. He's a holy God, and he's an all-powerful God. In fact, the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, oftentimes refer to God as the Almighty. The term in Hebrew would be the El Shaddai, the one who is omnipotent, able to do all things. And I think the reason this is important is at the end of the day, the reason you and I can be confident that God will fulfill all the loving plans he has for us is because he's all-powerful. You see, I love you as a pastor. Certainly don't love you the way God does. He loves perfectly. But without the power of God, my love is often impotent. Oftentimes, that's the hardest thing, being a pastor, is seeing someone hurting, and you can't do anything about it. Now, I say do anything about it. We can go before the throne of grace. And of course, that's all we need. But in our humanness, we say, I'd love to pull the string and do something different than God is doing. It's human, and it's really, in a sense, sinful to think that we can do that which God can't. But nonetheless, we can be confident that God can save us because he is all-powerful. And this is something that Moses talked about. And here's the song of Moses in Exodus 15. Listen to what he says of God's power. Exodus 15, 4 through 6, he said, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, And the choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Now, let me stop there. It's easy for us as Americans, I think, to yawn and say, oh, yeah, God destroyed Pharaoh and his army. That's great. Let's move on. But I want you to think about that was the superpower of the day. Now, they didn't have nuclear weapons or aircraft carriers, but that was a world superpower. And yet God just demolished their army. And he did it quickly. That's the kind of power he has. Continuing on in verse 5 of Exodus 15. 
It says the deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Verse 6, Exodus 15, he says, Your right hand, O Yahweh, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. Now, notice here, Moses is extolling the right hand of God. And that's because the right hand is typically the hand of power and strength in the Old Testament. But let me ask you the question, when we get to the New Testament, who is it that was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of God? It's the Messiah, isn't it? And in the Bible, the Son is the fullest expression of God's strength. That's why, for example, in Isaiah 53, verse 1, the Messiah is likened to the very arm of Yahweh. The, so the fullest expression in, for power to save is seen through the Son. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming that when we read Exodus 15, 6 and we see the mention of right hand, that here Moses was making a messianic reference. What I'm simply saying to you is you and I know when we read the rest of the book that it's the Son who is the fullest expression of this power to save. Dear ones, God's power to shatter the enemies is why his love will endure. Because not only does he love us, but he has the power to keep us in that love. And that's something that we should absolutely worship God and give him praise and glory about. Let me give you another passage that talks about the power of God. When we go to Numbers chapter 11, I'll give you the context. Remember there, the Israelites are grumbling because they are sick of the food they've been eating. They've been eating manna till it was coming out of their ears. And they start grumbling grievously against God. They say, God, didn't at least we have meat back in Egypt to eat? So God, being loving and being long-suffering, decides that he's going to give the people meat. And he tells Moses he's going to give them so much meat for 30 days, it's going to be coming out of their nostrils. Well, Moses says, well, how in the world are you going to do that, God? There's 600,000 of these Israelites. What am I supposed to do, drain the ocean and fish to give it to them? So Moses is questioning really the power of God. He's wondering, how is he going to do this? And in response to that, God says this to Moses. Numbers eleven twenty three. it says, Yahweh said to Moses, is Yahweh's power limited? Stop there. What's the answer to the question? No, it's not. Now he says, you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. And I was thinking, you know, here we read about this, and it happens shortly after the Exodus. But how apropos those words are for every believer in every generation. You see, as a believer living in America in 2017, you might ask yourself the question, can I really be sure today that I'm going to inherit the promises of God, eternal life, a glorious kingdom, and a resurrection? And the answer would still be the same. Is Yahweh's power limited? No. And you could add, now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. Because there is a day, dear ones, in history that he's appointed where he will break through the clouds and he will bring about all of those promises. Now, what's interesting is notice when he asked the question, is the power, Lord's power limited? The term limited there, katser, means is it short? Is it truncated? Is it unable to do that which God has promised? And so what's being accentuated here is that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And again, that's why you and I can be confident that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Now, one caveat I want to put out there, I've seen this air made. When we talk about God being all-powerful or omnipotent, that does not mean that God acts in ways that are contradictory to his nature. So, for example, even though God is all-powerful, he will never sin. Why? Because it is his nature to be holy and to be pure. Uh, Some people will be uh, wise guys and they'll say, well, wait a minute, if God's all-powerful, could he make a round square? No, because that would also contradict his nature. He's a God of order, not disorder. So God will always act and he can do all things, but he doesn't act in ways that are contradictory to his nature. Now, dear ones, the fact that he is all-powerful, though, means that he has all power to create, he has all power to judge, he has all power to heal, and he has all power to save. And so that's why you and I can be confident of entering the kingdom of God. David said the very thing. He 
praise God for his power. More than likely, this praise came as David received all of the desires of his heart, including the great Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. That's, I think, the context. David said in Psalm 21, 13, Be exalted, O Yahweh, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Let me ask you the question, how is it that David could rule in Zion in security? Was it his strength or was it God's unlimited strength? Now, how are you going to be guaranteed to one day reign in Zion in a resurrected body? Is it by your strength or is it by his? Brothers and sisters, because God is all-powerful, and he's made you a promise for everlasting life, you will receive it. That's great news. Now, let's go on to talk about our second point, and that is we are secure in Christ's hand. I want to personalize this with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, being truly God, is all-powerful. He has the same attributes as the Father. And this is why we can be absolutely confident that no one can ever snatch us out of his hand. In fact, Jesus says as much in John 10, 27 through 28. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Notice, dear ones in red, no one can ever snatch them out of Jesus' hand. Why? Because he's God. I made a saying once when I was doing a message with Bob up in Canada, and that is, you and I are not being held in the grip of a dead man's hand but we're being held in the grip of the resurrected Christ, who being fully God has the same power as God. In fact, Jesus went on to say in verse 29 through 30, he said, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. When Jesus says that he and the Father are one, he's not saying that they're the same person. He's not saying that God just changes costumes. Sometimes he has the Father costume on, sometimes the Son. No, what he's saying is that they're one in purpose and one in power. That they are identical in essence in the sense that neither of them is truncated. And they have the same purpose in saving the people of God. Now, I'm going to show you one of the greatest verses to me in all of the Bible, the greatest promises. Notice here Jesus says, they will never perish. One of the first things that I learned when I was learning the Greek language was to understand that this was a negation of what's called the subjunctive mood. Now, that's probably not very exciting to me, but let me explain why it is exciting. Normally, when the Bible uses verbs, it uses the indicative verb. The indicative verb is simply used to indicate something. If I say, the carpet is red, the is, the linking verb, is in the indicative mood. It's indicating something, that the carpet is red. But here... The subjunctive mood is being used. The subjunctive mood has to do with possibility. And so you see, it's one thing to negate the indicative mood and saying, well, they'll never perish. But Jesus here doubles down. And the biblical author, John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, shows him negating a subjunctive mood, saying that there's not even a possibility of their being perishing. It's not that they just won't perish. There's not even a possibility of any future perishing. It is the most poignant way in the Greek language that someone could negate something. And that's exactly how the Holy Spirit inspired John to write this text. Jesus is saying that there's not even a possibility of your perishing. That's how secure you are in his hand. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the different stages in a Christian's life. And the reason why is I think most believers are saying, yeah, I'm not worried about anything in the creation separating me from God. But truth be told, what usually concerns Christians are different stages in their Christian walk. And I break it into three. Number one, our first stage of the Christian walk is that in the body prior to our physical death. And we should know that in our body, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit is interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. Jesus Christ is interceding for us while he's preparing a place for us in the heavenly realm. Now let's skip ahead to the third stage. The third stage of the Christian walk is the resurrection life. And I don't think there's any Christian who's afraid of living in a resurrected body eternally with God. So the problem comes with the second stage. And that's what I refer to as the intermediate state. The intermediate state is the stage that a Christian is in 
after their physical body dies and they go to be with the Lord, but it's prior to the resurrection. And that's usually the stage of life that a Christian is most concerned about because we don't know what it's like to be without our physical body. Now, I'm going to give you some words of comfort, and especially in light of what we've gone through with Milford, and we're going to be talking more about this this coming Friday at his service. But I want to show you a passage that should give us absolute confidence that even if we're absent from the body, that is, we physically died, we are alive. We are alive with the living God. Now, the stage I want to set for you is the passage I'm going to show you is Matthew chapter 22. And remember there, Jesus was arguing with the Sadducees. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. In fact, they didn't even believe in any of the books of the Bible except the first five, the Pentateuch. And so they're trying to put a real stumper to Jesus. They come up with this Leverite marriage law, and they say, hey, Jesus, if there's an afterlife, what about this? They say there was a woman and a man, they're married, the man dies, Well, the Leverite marriage law in the Old Testament said that the woman had to be, if there was a brother, married to the next brother. Well, that happens. And in their scenario, there are seven brothers and all of them die. And the stumper is, well, who, if there is an afterlife, does she belong to in heaven? Ha ha, Jesus, we got you. (laughs) But not so fast. Jesus responds that they they know neither the power of God nor the scriptures. And to cut to the chase, let me show you what Jesus does. He appeals to the very character of God. Matthew twenty two thirty one through 32. He says, But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Now let me just stop there. Before I read verse 32, that is a citation, notice in all caps, from Exodus 3, 6. Now, why does Jesus cite Exodus 3, 6? After all, if he wanted to prove the resurrection, he could have gone to Isaiah 26. He could have gone to Daniel 12. There are many Old Testament passages that do teach on the resurrection. But notice those passages would not be accepted by the Sadducees because they only accepted the first five books. So Jesus takes a passage out of one of the books that they would receive as canonical. That's why he borrows from Exodus 3, 6. But listen to his argument. He cites Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, notice Jesus' conclusion. He gives you commentary on it. Jesus in red, he says, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You see, if the Sadducees were right and all you were was so much fodder in the ground after you died, well, that's bad advertising for God. Because then the covenant living God is a God of three dead men. And what kind of life-giving, eternal, powerful God is the God of three dead men? That's bad advertising for God. It's horrific if you think about it. What a way to denigrate God to say that those who die in him perish. And so Jesus is appealing to the fundamental nature of God that he's all-powerful and that he is a covenant-keeping God and that he is a life-giving God. In fact, notice the very grammar itself. He says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He didn't say, I was. He doesn't say, I will be. He is. He is the God of the living. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, therefore, have to be living. Otherwise, God is not the life-giving God, but he's the God of three dead men. And what that means is that when you die and shut off this mortal coil, as they say, you're going to be going right into the presence of God who will never deny you, who will receive you and keep you, and you will be as alive as you ever have been. The very character of God is at stake, according to Jesus, when it comes to life after death. Now, our security in the intermediate state, again, the intermediate state I'm referring to is after physical death, but prior to the resurrection, can also be seen by the fact that Jesus Christ guaranteed the thief on the cross who had come to faith in him that that very day he would be with him in paradise. That's what Jesus says here in Luke 23, 43. It says, and he said to him, this is the thief on the cross, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now, notice that today, 
Many scholars are kind of hesitant, I guess you would say, to take the today in a temporal sense. They take it more in a grand theological sense that today there's an epoch of time that's coming about where you will see glory. But I think that that's a bunch of nonsense. If you're dying on the cross and you say, Lord, remember me, you don't have time for all that. What Jesus is saying is today, that very day that that man is going to perish, he was going to be with Christ in paradise. And paradise, we have to understand, is synonymous with heaven itself. In fact, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation 2 7. I'll do a little bit of turning in the Bible now with you. Revelation 2 7. I'm going to show you this is Jesus addressing the church at Ephesus. And I want you to see how he likens this idea of paradise to heaven itself. Now, as you're turning to Revelation 2 7, paradise in both Old and New Testament understanding would be that of the Garden of God. That was what was taken at the garden because of sin is going to be reestablished. It's going to be beautiful beyond description. In fact, when you read at the end of the book of Revelation, what was taken from us because of our sin in the garden is reestablished. And so notice here in Revelation 2 7, the message to Ephesus Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life was that which was banned because of sin to Adam and Eve, but through Christ it's reestablished. The paradise of God, therefore, is synonymous with heaven itself. In fact, the apostle Paul traveled there, remember? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that he was caught up to the third heaven, and he called that paradise. And so wonderful was it that God had to give him a thorn in the flesh so that he wouldn't boast. So wonderful was it that this Paul who saw it said, for me, he said, to live, as, to live as Christ and to die as gain. It's so wonderful that the Apostle Paul could say this in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. He said, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, he says, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Now, what's interesting is notice that verb in verse 8, to be at home with the Lord. To be at home, endomeo is the verb. Lonida defines, it's a Greek lexicon, it defines it this way. It says, it is to be in a place that one rightfully and normally belongs. Dear brothers and sisters, you and I rightfully and normally belong to be with our God. You see, when Milford went home, the other day, he went, for, he went to where he rightfully belongs. It's what it's all about. This isn't what it's about. It's about going there. And it's about a resurrected life one day forevermore. That's where he normally belongs. Why? Because God is a life-giving God. And therefore, nothing will ever separate you from his presence. Nothing can ever separate you from being alive with him. Now, there are certain believers that I've met in just throughout the days that I've been a minister, even before, that they'll say, well, you know what? I'm not afraid to die, but I am afraid to be on, in this world when Jesus Christ returns. And I've always was puzzled with that, but they think that they could be objects of God's wrath. What they're claiming is, is that when God pours out his wrath, they're going to have to go through it. And my claim back to them is, hey, doesn't 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 say that we have not been destined to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord? So when the Lord returns or he pours out his wrath, you and I do not have to fear that as well. We've been guaranteed exemption from that wrath. Now, when I teach that doctrine or Bob teaches that doctrine, you know, sadly, many Christians, and these are people I, I believe are true Christians, they'll call us escapists. That somehow we're just teaching an escapism doctrine where we don't want to teach people that they have to suffer. Well, I want to let you know that it's not escapism to believe the promises of God. And we've been promised exemption from his wrath. So not only are we spared when we die physically, but if he comes and pours out his wrath, that will also not separate us from the love of Christ. And this is not some new doctrine. Some people say, well, that doctrine's brand new, the idea that the people of God would be exempt from his wrath. Oh, really? Well, let me show you it's not new. Isaiah taught it some 700 years prior to Christ's coming. Listen to what Isaiah wrote. 
Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. A great promise for the people of God. This is New Testament eschatology written 700 years in advance. He said, your dead will live, their corpses will rise. That's the resurrection. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn. By the way, let me stop there. Dew was always life-giving. That's why he mentions it. That's why uh, the dew was given to the Israelites even during the Exodus wanderings. It was always regarded as life-giving. And so this is all about the dead coming to life and being given life. And notice he says, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. How much clearer could Isaiah be in referring to a physical resurrection? Now, we have a physical resurrection. Now, what's interesting is in verse 20, you're going to see that the people of God after the resurrected are going to be hidden somewhere before the wrath of God comes. Notice in verse 20, he says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation, that za'am in Hebrew, it's literally wrath, until wrath runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Three things are true of this passage that are also taught in the New Testament. Number one, there's going to be a resurrection for the people of God. Number two, they're going to be hidden from the wrath of God. And number three, the wrath of God comes. Do you know what the New Testament teaches? That there's going to be a resurrection. The people of God are hidden until the wrath is done. Then the wrath comes. That's what the New Testament teaches. Luke chapter 17, Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. What happened with that Noah, that rascal, and his family? Well, they were saved in the ark, and then what happened? The wrath came. In fact, turn your Bibles. He talks about Lot the same way. There's a precedent in Scripture. The people of God are saved, and then the wrath comes. Turn your Bibles to Luke 17, verses 29 through 30. Luke 17, verses 29 through 30. Please turn your Bibles there. I'll grab a quick drink. Luke 17, 29 through 30. Jesus says, But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, notice he went out, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So what's the precedent found in Scripture? The people of God are resurrected, they're removed, and the wrath comes. So no, we don't even have to fear when the wrath of God comes. We don't have to fear the intermediate state. There's no stage in life, there's nothing that can happen that can ever threaten our security and are being found in the promises of God and as objects of his love. Now, let me leave you with one final passage. In the first century, many Christians were concerned that their loved ones who had died in the Lord, that they would miss out somehow on the blessings of the resurrection when Jesus Christ came. So this is an actual objection in history, and so they put that to Paul. In fact, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. I want you to see how he addresses that. And again, he's just showing that at whatever stage of life you're in, it cannot separate you from Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 14. Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Notice he's speaking to the brothers and sisters. About those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... God will bring with him, the term bring, a go, literally to carry, he will carry with him those who have fallen asleep, that is, they died in Jesus. So those who have died in Jesus aren't going to be left behind. They're, going to, they're not going to miss out on the promises of God. And then I'll continue. He doubles down here, 1 Thessalonians four sixteen through 18. He says, for the Lord himself will descend. Let me stop there. I love that. The Lord himself. This is what's called an adjectival intensive. Why do I love it so? Because it says that when Jesus Christ returns, he's not sending some stand-in, some surrogate, some stunt double, some agent, some other person to go on his behalf. He's coming for us personally. 
He's coming bodily. He came personally for us the first time. He's coming personally for us the second time. And that way, if anyone says, hey, you know what? I saw Jesus over here, or I was listening to the Christ consciousness. Don't believe it. He's coming for us bodily. He himself is coming. It says he will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They're not going to miss out. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Dear brothers and sisters, there is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of Christ. There is no stage in your Christian life There's no place that you could ever be in your Christian walk that will separate you from the promises of God and from eternal life. And what that means is you go out the door today, you can live a fearless life, a life that doesn't care what the world can do to you, but a life that's only concerned about pleasing the God who purchased you through the blood of the Son. Dear ones, nothing will ever separate you from the love of Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great promises that you are so powerful that you can keep us and that all of your loving plans for us will indeed be fulfilled. We give you praise for your love and your mercy. We thank you, God, that one day you will break through the clouds and that you're coming bodily to raise us up bodily. We thank you for these profound promises. And I ask, Lord, for those who are hurting here today, that these things would sustain them in the dark days of life. I pray that each of us would be able to go out and live a fearless life and be salt and light in a dying and decaying world. I pray, Heavenly Father, for the Johnson family as they continue to grieve their loss. I pray, Lord, that you'd instill this celebration and that this coming Friday we would celebrate a life well-lived, More importantly, the mightiness of your saving hand through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Please stand, if you will, for the benediction. From Jude 24 and 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. We'll see you Thursday and Friday of this week.